Okay, so today we will talk about extraaxial hemorrhages. This is part two of a series called head trauma, where we will discuss things pertaining to neuroradiology. So let's define the term extraaxial spaces. These extraaxial spaces are locations outside the brain parenchyma bleeding within these extraaxial spaces outside the brain parenchyma is known as extraaxial hemorrhage now these extraaxial spaces do not always exist all the time majority of them are just potential spaces they exist only when there is some collection and the subarachnoid space is the only extraaxial space which is an actual space which is present always because it contains the csf so let's discuss the layers of the brain from outside to inside. Outermost, we have the calvaria. In the calvaria, the outer table, the inner table. Then we have the three layers of meninges, the dura outside, then the arachnoid, and then the pia mater. The dura itself has two layers, the outside periosteal layer, the inner meningeal layer. Any collection above the most superficial layer of the dura that is above the periosteal layer and below the inner table of the calvaria that is the epidural space anything below the dura that is below the meningeal layer of the dura and above the arachnoid that is the subdural space and below the arachnoid is the subarachnoid space let's start with epidural hematomas these as we all know occur when there is bleeding between the inner table of the calvaria and the periosteal layer of the dura 90% of the times the source of this bleeding is an arterial source which is the most common artery that is implicated here that is a branch of the maxillary artery which is in turn a branch of the external carotid artery and is in close relation with a very thin part of the skull called the terion which is a junction of the frontal, sphenoidal, parietal and squamosal part of the temporal bone and is very susceptible to fracture. Yes, it is a middle meningeal artery. Okay, now as I told you, 90% of the bleed in an epidural hematoma comes from an artery, which is the middle meningeal artery. Their shape has been classically described as this biconvex or lens shaped because the periosteal layer of the dura is very tightly adhered to the inner table of the calvaria and they get stripped as the EDH expands. So the middle portion will always be thicker or wider in comparison to the ends. Also, at the suture, this attachment is very, very adherent. And therefore, these usually do not cross the sutures. Two exceptions in children's because the sutures are not yet ossified and in case the fracture is a diastatic fracture. Let's talk about the imaging features. What we can see in this axial non-contrast CT, it demonstrates this biconvex hyperdense hematoma in the left parietal region. And we can clearly see this subgallial hematoma overlying the EDH. Also, a very interesting thing that we can see here is this heterogeneous hypointensity within the blood actually demonstrates fresh unclotted blood having a lower Hansfield value and this typical sign is known as the Schwell sign. What we can also see is the EDH pushes the cortex medially and what we can see is buckling of the gray white interface. Now very important danger signs to look for in an EDH is number one if the thickness of the hemorrhage becomes more than 1.5 centimeters the volume of the hematoma becomes more than 30 mm midline shift more than 5 mm and there is this Schwell sign whenever these signs are present we should be on high alert mode because these patients can require surgical intervention. Now, I told you that 90% of the EDHs, their source of blood is an artery. Therefore, the rest 10% is a venous bleeding. Let's talk about venous EDHs. What happens here is a skull fracture that crosses a dural venous sinus. There is tearing of the dural layer and accumulation of this blood from the dural sinus into the epidural space. Now, these venous EDHs are very difficult to diagnose because they are very subtle and slow growing both clinically as well as imaging wise. Let's discuss the three very important venous types of EDHs. The first one is a vertex EDH. Here we can see a hyperdense biconvex hematoma at the region of the vertex. Here the fracture causes injury to the superior sagittal sinus which is the source of the bleeding. And this vertex EDH can cross the midline as we can see in this image also. The second is a anterior temporal EDH. Here the sinus involved in the bleeding is the sphenoparietal venous sinus. There is this biconvex hyperdense collection in the anterior tip of the middle cranial fossa. However, these EDHs are limited medially by the orbital fissure and laterally by the sphenotemporal suture. The third one is a clival EDH, which is very subtle. There is a collection under the clival dura, usually seen in children following a neck injury, which is usually a hyperflexion or a hyperextension injury. These are limited by the attachment of the dura to the busy sphenoid and also the tectorial membrane. And very important thing to remember is in these types of clival EDH, there can be multiple cranioneuropathies. Most commonly involved cranial nerve is the sixth nerve followed by ninth followed by eleventh. 
Let's move over to the subdural hematomas. We already know whenever there is collection of blood below the dura, that is below the meningeal layer of the dura and above the arachnoid, it is a subdural hematoma. And the source of the bleeding is usually tearing of the bridging cortical veins as they cross the subdural space to enter into the dural venous sinuses. And more often than not, it is a superior sagittal sinus that is involved. Now let's move on to the CT imaging findings of a subdural hematoma. We will see this hyperdense crescentric extraaxial collection along the left lateral convexity in this image. Similar to an EDH, we here also we can see buckling of the grey-white interface as well as a Schwell sign. And because these SDHs are below the dura, they can very well cross the suture lines. However, they will usually not cross the dural attachments. Now, these subdural hematomas can be acute, subacute, and chronic. Let's look at some other morphological variants of acute subdural hematomas. In the first image, what we can see is a linear hyperdense collection along the right tentorium cerebelli. This is a acute peritentorial SDH. In the second image, we see a hyperdense collection in the anterior fox. It is an acute parafalcine SDH. In the third image, we can see an isodense crescentric extraxial collection along the left lateral convexity of the skull. This kind of isodense collection in an acute SDH can be seen in patients of severe anemia. That we need to keep in mind. Let's move on to the subacute subdural hematomas. These are usually several days to several weeks old containing partially liquefying clot, resolving blood products. Now, they become surrounded by a membrane which is made up of an organizing granulation tissue known as the neomembrane. They are two-layered. The outer superficial layer, which is thicker, adheres to the dura and the lower layer or the deeper layer overlies a thin and delicate arachnoid. These membranes may enhance especially the superficial thicker layer. The density of the SDH keeps decreasing at the rate of 1 to 2 Huntsville unit per day and by 7 to 10 days they may even become isodense. So how to detect isodense SDHs? Look for mass effects like medial shift of the cortex or medial shift of the ventricles of the same side. Like in this picture, we have a right frontoparietal elliptical isodensity compressing the right cerebral hemispheres and causing effacements of the gyri and the sulci. Mass effect is noted in the form of mild midline shift and compression of the right lateral ventricle. Now, with continued degradation of the blood products, the SDH becomes more liquefied and it is now a chronic SDH. The collection now is a large serous fluid tinged with blood products. These are also encapsulated by the membranes that we had talked about and there can be re-hemorrhage in these cases and we call it an acute on chronic SDH. Now, what do we see in this picture is a hypodense crescentric fluid collection along the right lateral convexity. What other things we can be seeing in a chronic SDH is the presence of Hematocrit effect, which we will discuss later on. Presence of loculations and trabeculations. Thickened membranes. These membranes can become thickened, which appears to be hyperdense. They can even calcify or ossify. Let's look at these three pictures of chronic SDH. The first picture shows hypodense crecentric collections, bilateral lateral convexities. This is a bilateral chronic SDH. In the second picture, we see on the left lateral convexity, there is this hypodense collections with multiple loculations. This is also a chronic SDH with loculations. In the third picture, we again see this chronic SDH on the left lateral convexity, but this time the encapsulated membranes appear hyperdense. In fact, they are ossified right now, and this is called an armored brain. In the next picture, we see an extra axial crecentric collection in the right lateral convexity, having this showing this hematocrit effect. This occurs when there are two different density blood products. Now, depending on the amount of cellular components, the heavier blood product settles down, and the lighter one is above. Like here, the more denser portion is the newly hemorrhaged blood which has more cellular components more dense and it has settled down and the older component is seen above this is the hematocrit sign seen in acute and chronic sdh now we need to differentiate these chronic sdhs from three things a subdural hygroma subdural effusion and subdural empyema which might look similar on ct similar hypodense collections extra axial first is a subdural hygroma here there is csf collection in the subdural space after an injury it has CSF density. It will show this hypodense crecentric extraaxial collection. No blood products, no encapsulating membranes and therefore no enhancement following contrast administration. And this collection usually communicates with the CSF spaces. However, a significant number of collections diagnosed as chronic subdural hematomas actually represent chronic subdural hygromas because CT is very difficult to differentiate. MR might help. Subdural effusion is accumulation of clear fluid over the cerebral convexities or interhemispheric fissures, usually a complication of a prior episode of meningitis. Effusions, a very big difference is they do not usually communicate with the CSF spaces. Subdural empyema is a collection of pus in the subdural space, usually secondary to an ongoing mastoiditis, sinusitis or even a meningitis. We can see a hypotense extraaxial collection in the subdural space having new membranes too, which show strong enhancement. The last is subarachnoid hemorrhage. As we all know, 
this is accumulation of blood products below the arachnoid that is between the arachnoid and the pyometer and this is an actual extraaxial space because it contains CSF. This subarachnoid hemorrhage is the most common type of traumatic extraaxial hemorrhages. These extend into the sulci. More common locations are the perisylvian regions, antero inferior temporal and frontal sulci, the hemispheric convexities. Sometimes a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage may occur in association with a traumatic intraocular hemorrhage which is termed as the Tursen syndrome. On imaging what do we see? Sulcal cisternal hyperdensities are seen. If it is of focal or patchy distribution, it is usually a traumatic SH. If it is of diffuse distribution, it is usually an aneurysmal SH. Now, in the picture that has been provided here, we can see diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage involving all the basal cisterns, the bilateral sylvian fissures, as well as the interhemispheric fissure. This is a diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. Another important term that we should know is a pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage, which can be a mimic. And the most common cause of a pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage is a diffuse cerebral edema. What happens here is there is a decreased parenchymal density. And due to a raised intracranial pressure, there is dilated, engorged superficial venous structures. Usually, this occurs as a result of hypoxic ischemic brain injury or a recent resuscitation from cardiopulmonary arrest. Okay, this was all for today. If I have missed out on anything, kindly let me know. I can add those things in my next video.